Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Wasserman. Mark has been an attorney for 24 years with his own practice, Law Offices of Mark D. Wasserman, a firm focusing on criminal defense, family law, personal injury, and business litigation. He is also the owner of Race Ipsa Productions, a production company which produces, plays, and films which touch on social issues to provoke thought. In 2004, Mark and his big brother Craig joined forces becoming the Pop Brothers at Law, an unparalleled cannabis industry law firm which advises and represents the cannabis industry in a variety of jurisdictions, championing the movement for legislation and educating US citizens about their constitutional rights when dealing with law enforcement. In addition, their Shut the F Up campaign has been gaining viral traction around the world. So, a very, very warm welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Robert. It's a pleasure to be here. That was a great intro. So before we dive into all your amazing achievements and experiences today, we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the Legally Speaking podcast, which is, on the scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very real, how real would you rate the reality hit series Suits in terms of its reality? One. (laughs) <laughs> because, because, and I wish I just had a stack of folders to go oh, here. I did that motion last night. Oh, here's another motion that I did just out of my butt here, here, here's another one. And they do scenes like that. Well, here's another one. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. I love the show, but real yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah i i think one given that you, you you know your way around the legal industry i think one is a fair answer so let's let's start at the beginning tell us a bit about your your sort of family background and, and upbringing firstly all right so i was born in uh california la california and i grew up in a city called cerritos cerritos california which is right on the outskirts of la county and uh, Orange County. It's like kind of right in the middle, but it's still LA County. And I've got two older brothers. My oldest brother has got uh, 10 years on me. He's a doctor and he actually has been advising the presidents with regards to COVID and the older people. He runs long-term end-of-life facilities. He's a geriatrician. My other brother, who we all know I work with, he's got eight years on me and dyes his hair. So everybody thinks I'm the older brother. <laughs> so I don't dye it. I don't dye it. So yep, that's my that's my big brother. He's uh he's more when it comes to this kind of stuff and everything else kind of behind the scenes and and uh not as active on social media as I am. But uh very integral to everything we do and keeping my ass in line, you know, my older brother. Yeah, good stuff. So did you always want to become an attorney? Was that always the plan? No, no. The plan was since I was, I don't know, nine, ten, I was an actor. I grew up with the bug doing summer stock and musical theater and all that kind of stuff. And when I got to college, uh, I was a theater arts major. I actually, when I was 18, I contracted meningitis. I almost died. And it gave me a little kick. Like, And I, w- right when I got better, I dropped out of college and went to Hollywood because that's what I wanted to do. And you don't need a degree. you know. And I was going after that theater arts degree. But I was like, I could die tomorrow, I guess. And it, that really kind of fueled the way I would live uh, the rest of my life. Like, got to do shit now or... Yeah. It might be too late. I don't know. So that's what I did. And then uh, I pounded the pavements out there in Hollywood until I decided I wanted to finance the plays and films I was starting to write. And when I realized I didn't want to get investor money because of all the film, everything I worked on, you see what happens. The people with the money want to control the creative people. And there's a lot of that going on. So like, hey, yeah, I need my own money to do it. And while I saw my oldest brother making a boatload being a doctor, there was no way I was going to school for yeah, whatever. It wasn't happening. Other brother here, he could go to law. I could do it. He could do it. I could do it. So I actually went to law school to make money to finance plays and films I was writing. So that was my initial motivation into law school. And I was always a horrible student throughout you know, kindergarten, grade school, high school, college. And when I decided I was going to go 
back and become an attorney. I had, you know, I, I dropped out after my first semester as a freshman. So when I finally went back, I basically, I went to community colleges, three different ones. And this is back in the 90s, you know, and I was doing TV courses where you watch the TV professor and then you take a test and you mail it in. I mean, I, I did whatever I had to do to go get my undergraduate degree. And then through the help of my brother and the law school he went to, I was able to get into this law school. He knew the president of the law school. And, you know, I, I wasn't the best student, but I'm a good talker. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the real Harvey Specter, actor turned lawyer, uh, but it, the actual reality. There we go. Well, I love that. I love that story. Oh, the 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 deep dive into that actual story will save for another day uh, <laughs> because it would haunt me. Because I was so scared of the way I got in. I was so scared of failing out. The president of the school was like, "I'm watching you. I'm watching you." And like I said, bad student. It was the first time in law school was the first time I uh, studied really and applied myself. I was scared. And, you know, for here in the States, I don't know how it is there, but when you go to law school orientation, you're with hundreds, thousands of people, whoever it is at the incoming class. And they tell you, look to your left, look to your right. Those people aren't going to be there when you graduate. And it was true. Those people weren't there after the first semester. It's crazy. And I studied 15 hours a day because out of just fear. <laughs> and I hated law. I hated school so much. There was no way I was going for three or four years. They had this impacted two and a half year program that, and as I said, I like to do fast, 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 fast. And I just, that's what I did. I completed law school in two and a half years. And then I would have never guessed that I'd have to take the California State Bar three times. Having gone through law school, and finally applying myself, study academically. I got you know, American Jurisprudence Awards. I got you know, law review. I was doing all this stuff in law school that I had never achieved academically anywhere else before. And oh, pre pretty cool, nice. But, but by that same token, I didn't give a fuck about my grades because I knew I wasn't, go I wasn't going to some big law firm. I wasn't trying to get a job like that. My brother had his own little practice and I knew some other attorneys. You know, and so I knew that I didn't have to kill myself for two and the whole time I was in law. I killed myself the first year just to know I could do it. And I got that cushion where I could kind of skate the rest of the way. And knowing that I wasn't relying on grades and all that to get a job, because that's really, I mean, I had you know, probably five to 10 of my really good friends from high school all went on to Harvard and Yale and all that shit and worked for be working 80 hours a week in big law, you know, and then now that some of them are partners in those, but you know, they went on that track. Nothing wrong with that. And that's for some people who want to do that. I always knew I wasn't. So when I got done with law school, I was like, okay, now I'm taking the bar. I took it so seriously in terms of studying for four months, taking a bar prep course. I stopped partying. I was big party animal, big dream. I stopped everything. And I, I did it. So I concentrated. I did everything they told me to do. I took all the practice exams. I was getting 90s and hundreds from the course and all that shit. And then I go, I take this exam for three days. And it's a three month wait after you take the exam here in, in California. And they only offer it twice a year. So I'm waiting for three months. And I get uh, it. So this is back in 1996. And I'll never forget it. Was uh, results were coming out, and the way they did the results back then was mail. And if you got a big envelope, it was your entire exam back with you failed. And here's all the marks and all the shit. You get a little envelope. Congratulations, you're a member of the California State Bar. And so that Friday night, the weekend, which we were expecting the mail to come like Monday or Tuesday was our law school graduation. And it was on a big yacht in the harbor. And we're all partying and every, And then somebody goes, hey, for the first time, you can call the state bar tomorrow morning and find out if you passed. They're opening up. Yeah. The and there was big discussion. Oh, should we call? Should we wait? What are you going to do? And, you know, so we're all getting, we're all wasted. We're all drunk. 
I wake up in my hotel room, hungover, with two nice young ladies that I had partied with. And one of them had gone to law school with me and was like, are you, are you going to call? Like, I don't know. I think I kind of want to wait, but you know what? I'm going to call. Screw it. So I call and I got right through. And I was expecting a busy signal because first time, but I got right through. And you hear California State Bar, last name, please. And I said, Wasserman. And then there's silence. And then I'm sorry, that name does not appear on the successful list. And I'm like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> and I pick up the phone and I call back. And of course, it's busy, right? And yeah. I call back and it's busy. And the girl's going, well, what's going on? And I get the fuck out of my room, right? And I get, get out of here. I, I get kick them out. And I'm calling. I think it took about an hour before it finally rang again. California State Bar, last name, please. I said, Wasserman, W-A-S-S-E-M, Mark, M-A-R-C. I'm spelling it out. I'm sorry, that name does not appear in a successful list. I go, oh, is there another list? Is it a wait list? What is this? What? What? And then hung up and then it, it, then it sinks in like, fuck, I, I didn't pass. And there was a half a bottle of vodka next to me from the night before. I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in two and a half years though, but I drank it then, drank that half a bottle, called my mom and dad, said, mom, dad, just found out I failed the bar. Please call everybody in our family and my friends. Because it was Saturday, the next Sunday, the next day was my law school graduation. And I was not going to go. There was no fucking way I was going to go after not passing the bar and not being an attorney. Because what? You, you graduate law school and what? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, I mean, so and I stayed in that room, I ordered a couple more bottles and pitied myself for a couple days. Got back up. And okay, I got to take it again. But this time, I ain't taking no fucking course. I'm going to go do whatever I do and live my life and, and study and whatever. And I did that for three months. And I kind of loosely studied and all this and that. I took the exam again. I even drank during lunch of that exam because I, I, I mean, I was so, it was just so crazy when I looked at, and I got that package back the first time and what, you know, and you're like, what the fuck? And so wait three months again. Now this time went to my brother's house on that. It was another Saturday morning and he had yeah. a fat line, a phone line. He had all these different lines in his house. We had like five phones and like me, my mom, dad, my brother, and his kids were calling, calling last name, please. Wasserman, sorry, that name does not appear on the successful list. So again, it happens. And I did, you know, now I was with my family. So <laughs> since there was no drinking going on or anything like that, nobody said anything. And I go, all right, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I went out that night with a buddy of mine who we were best friends in law school, a guy named John. He's an attorney, good friend of mine from law school, and he used to, and he does jujitsu and shit. And oh, I did wow. a movie, and I cast him in this in this part. And so that's the guy I'm talking about, John. And he went to law school. His second career, his first career was undercover cop, Asian gang unit. And boy, he had some stories. I tell you that because when we studied for the bar, we studied for the bar together the first time. And then I took it. He something happened. Somebody in his family died or something, and he had to go. He couldn't take the bar. So he studied again with me the second time. Second time, I take the bar. His wife, who was pregnant, was having some major problems with the pregnancy that ended up turning out good, but he couldn't take the bar again. Yeah. So then now the third time, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he's and he has never taken it, but he studied twice. So he's going, Mark, I got, I'm, I got to take this fucking thing. I'm going to study again. And I found a guy who, who concentrates on repeat test takers. If you've taken it more than three times or twice, then, you know, he's got this course that he says he can help you. 
And so I was, I was, yeah, I'm going to spend another fucking $3,000 on a course. And you know, it's expensive to do all this shit. And then, but he was like, Mark, we just do it, do it with me. You know, and I was okay, I'll do it. And so I go to this course, this attorney named Paul Thau, and his whole like tagline was, I climbed Mount Everest. You can do anything. You can pass this. It's just figuring out how to take the test. And it's funny because to look at the guy, like when I first met him, like, yeah, right. You climbed Mount Everest. And there's a whole like Life Magazine story on him. And, you know, and he did it. And, you know, people die climbing Mount Everest. And he explained his little philosophy was if you do it the right way, if you know what you're doing and you prepare and you do it the way you prepare, uh, you're not going to die. Same with this bar. And he taught, you know, the law and all that. You have it, you know it and all that. He teaches you how to take this test for the people who are grading it. And he was a grader of the bar exam for so many years. So the other thing I decided to do, I took this course. It was a one month course. And then he's teaching and then he sends you on your way to implement those tools. And so the other two times I studied, I would I, you know, be in the library somewhere or my parents' house or my room or whatever. And so I decided this time I was going to go study a coffee shop. Let's have that. A Starbucks opened up right near my parents' house in 1996. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and study at start right in the middle of everything. Because when you take a bar exam, well, back in the day before COVID, you're in a room with three, four, five thousand people, and yeah. everyone, and there's noise and there's distractions, sneeze and this and that. Or well, I'll never forget one exam. You know, they tell you, you get lunch, come back, 1.30, the doors close and they're locked. And some guy was missed it and he was banging on the door, crying, please let me. You know, it's like going to court. If you're late in court and that you, uh, you're late, warrant for your client's arrest or, you know, I mean, it's, you can't mess around. So I, I, I understand why they do that. So I, I decided that I was going to sit there and study amongst all this chaos at a coffee shop so I can study through any distraction. And that's what I did for three and a half months. I sat there every day, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And as luck would have it, not only did a Starbucks open up in this town center near my parents' house in 1996, they also opened a TGI Fridays. So I would go at 6 p.m. after I was done studying, walk across the street, TGI Fridays, 6 p.m. to midnight, get drunk, go home, wake up 5.30 in the morning and do it all again. And I did that three and a half months, sat there and studied. And then before I left to take the bar exam the third time, as you can imagine, studying for three, three bar exams, I accumulated so much material and practice exams and all just, and I took it all. I put it in the backyard of my parents' house, right next to a fire pit they have. And I doused it with kerosene and I lit it on fire because I was never taking the test again, no matter what. And I didn't know at that moment, I just knew I was never taking it again. And we'll see what happens. And so I go off, I take the exam. And now again, we have three months to wait. So, you know, here in the States, after you take a bar exam, you know, you're no longer a law student. You're not an attorney yet. And you can't get it. Well, I couldn't get a job. Try to get a clerk job. Well, but if you pass the bar in three months, you'll be an attorney and you'll be gone. We don't need an attorney. Well, you can't be an attorney yet. So you can't get that job. As I always say, I, at that, in between there, I'm just a dick. I just a dick floating around. I got to wait and see what happens. I could go, you know, work at McDonald's or whatever. But I decided to go back to that coffee shop. I sat for three months every day and I wrote a screenplay about my experiences studying for this exam. I mean, if you imagine if you go to a coffee shop for three and a half months from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., you are going to meet character after people after people. And, you know, it just definitely right. And then I wrote this screenplay and then waited for or not waited for the results. Then the results came around and I passed. And this time, the way it happened was. I was, I had decided I'm waiting for the mail. I ain't calling up anymore and just I'm waiting for the mail and I don't care. And so on, it was Saturday morning again. My brother calls me up at six in the morning and I'm saying, oh, hello, you passed. You're an attorney, you passed. 
the fuck? It's six in the morning. You got <laughs> fuck you. You really, you got to do this to me. You know, and I, my brother fucking with me, right? <laughs> I'm, ki- I'm not kidding. It's on the internet. The what? On the internet. I mean, the internet barely came out, you know, or whatever, you know, this yeah. is 1996. And I go, okay, so now this ages me really good. So I go to, I'm in, I live living with my parents, right? I go into my dad's den where he has what's called a Commodore 64 computer with a dial up modem. Oh, yes. And, and that was back then, that was like one of the cheapest. And it just, there was no way. It wasn't, it wasn't connecting. So we drove over to my brother's house who had whatever was the latest at that time. He, he had it. And he got on the internet, went to the successful list, and there was my name. And it was, I don't even know. I, I still, I, the, that single moment of seeing it and realizing that everything I went through and kept going through. And then we went in the backyard of my brother's house and sat there with my dad and him, smoked a big fat joint with my dad. First time we did that, he only took two hits. And then my brother said, here's 250 bucks. Let's drive to Vegas. And we drove Uh. to Vegas four hours away. I turned that 250 into 500 in two hours. We drove back. And then uh, my brother said... Well, you passed law school, you passed the bar. Now what the fuck are you going to do? You got a job? (laughs) And so the funniest thing is, and I've been telling this uh, on Clubhouse to uh, law students and repeat bar takers and stuff, because there's, you know, you can do this and, and you don't necessarily have to go work for some big firm or anybody else. And this happened to me because it's just the way it happened. I, as I mentioned, I couldn't get a job before I found out I passed. And then as I was going to start sending out resumes, two days after I got sworn in, I'm at that coffee shop, Starbucks, to go get my my triple latte, which is what was my drink back then, which is the name of the screenplay. So triple latte, you'll be watching out for that. And one of the customers saw me. He goes, hey, are you an attorney now? And I said, as a matter of fact, I am. I got sworn in two days ago. And he said, um, oh, my cousin just got a DUI. Can you help? And my dumbass just said, yeah, sure. Here's my number. <laughs> Give my number. Have him call me tomorrow. And so I walked out and I get on the phone. I call my brother. Hey, I, I think I just got a case. I don't know. What the fuck do I do? I got <laughs> DUI and what do we do, man? And he goes, call Robert, friend of my brother's. So this is the benefit of having a brother who's been practicing 10 years. He knows attorneys. So I call Robert, who'd been doing criminal defense for 25 years. And I say, hey, Robert, got a new case. I met this guy, DUI. How much do I charge? That was my first question. How much do I charge for this? And he said, now, 1996, he said, for criminal defense to do an arraignment and the pretrial, I charge 750 bucks. I thought, well, okay. Uh, And he goes, I'll split it with you. I'll teach you. I'll show you the ropes, bring you to court introduce you to the judges and show you how to run the case, teach you how to do it. I said, Oh, okay. What if I can get more than seven fifty? And he goes, I, you know, that's what I charge. You know, that's, that's what I charge. 25 years of practice, just seven fifty. It just didn't set right with me, not knowing anything else. So I started making phone calls to criminal defense attorneys in the area. Hey, I got a DUI. Uh, what do you charge? And I, it was like five grand, four grand, three grand, and all with the same type of experience. And so I'm like, geez, you're really underselling yourself, I thought. And so the next day I get the call from the possible client. And the first thing this guy says is, you know, my cousin told me you just passed the bar and became an attorney. Have you ever fucking been to court? How do you know what you're doing? I, this is my life. I don't want to go to jail. I got a DUI and I don't think I, and he just, you know, as he should, I go, you know, those are all great questions. And I'll answer each one of them. Yeah, just became an attorney. Never went to court. You're my first client. And he's, and he's, I can hear him through the phone going, well, why, why? you know, I talked to these two other attorneys that have been doing it for five years. Another guy's been doing it for 10. I go, well, that's good. Here's, here's how it works. See, because I have an older brother who's been doing this a long time, I have connections to a criminal defense attorney who's been doing it for 25 years. He's an expert. He usually charges five, six grand, but he's only charging you 1500. And then I get to learn. He's going to teach me shit. I'm going to go to court with you. He's going to run the case. I get to learn. You get two attorneys for the price of one. And you get an expert for like a massive discount. And 
<laughs> he met me the next day and gave me $1,500 cash. And I was like, wow, wow. Because yeah. one of the things that first came to my mind was my, I told you, I have friends who went to the Ivy leagues and they worked for the big firms and all that shit. And I was tell, I told, told them this little story as it was happening. And they're like, and you, you get to keep all that money. I go, well, now I'm going to split it with the guy. And he goes, still, you're going to keep half of that. If we bring in a case, we get a pat on the back. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Nothing else. And so I realized just the difference from working for yourself versus working for a big, medium, whatever kind of firm. So I went back to Robert and I said, hey, I got 1500 bucks. And I, get, oh, no, I gave him 750 And he goes, oh, I told you I'd split that with you. I go, no, that's your half. And he goes, what do you mean? And I got... I got 1500 He goes, well, how'd you do that? So I just asked, Robert, you're, you're undervaluing yourself. And, you know, it's funny because I, I taught me there are great, great attorneys out there, eh, great people in all sorts of professions, but they don't, they can't ask people for money or, you know, yeah. they, whatever it is. You know, I, I, I certainly don't have that problem, especially when I know there's value and stuff like that. So, so he was like, Mark, that's, that's great that you can do that. I just want Half of the 750, I told you, you should keep the rest because you got, and I I tried to force it on him, but I'm only going to force so much. You want to keep, okay, I'll keep (laughs) it. Cool. And so that sent me on my path of my law practice, which was, I did everything. And I was out there at coffee shops, at libraries, at restaurants, at stores, at swap meets, at events, at wherever I was with my business cards. And what I, and to this day, you know, our business cards, I'll have to send you some. It has our, we'll get to that later, the, the whole shut the fuck up and the script and I don't consent yeah. to searches. So this bottom part that says, I don't consent to searches, uh, let me contact my attorney and all that, invoking my fifth, my law school professor had showed us his card. I have this on the back of my cards. So all my clients know not to talk to the police and not to consent to searches. And so I slapped that on the back of my card. And then I thought, not only is it good for that, but every time I gave my card to somebody and they would look at it, what do people do with cards? Put it in their pocket, put it in a bag, put it wherever, anywhere, but their wallet. Not with my card. That card belongs in your wallet behind your ID Read it. I hope you never need it. But if you get pulled over and you have to, you're going to pull out your ID and you're like, oh yeah, I remember my rights. And so direct marketing, I get my card inside everybody's wallet behind their ID. And I started doing that in 1996. And so, hey, you have a contract dispute? Yes. You will? Yes. You need real estate? Yes. You need whatever. And I would go through my brother's connections and the ones I created an attorney who did it, split the fee, learn how to do it. And that was it. And then after, you know, four or five years, I honed in on criminal defense and family law and I didn't need help anymore. I did personal injury too for a time. Uh, But after about five years, I didn't need help anymore. And I was able to do what I, what I wanted to do. So that's, that's how I started my law practice. Law offices of Mark D. Wasserman. Thank you so much for sharing that enlightening journey from the sort of bar and that story. I thought you were going to say when you went to the coffee shop, the owner was like, I've just lost my best customer for the last three and a half months. So what am I going to do? Um, but anyway, we I always forward. went back. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Fast forward a little bit. You did then join forces um, with your big brother and became the Pop Brothers at Law. Tell us a little bit more about the business and, uh, and what, it, what, what you focus on now. Pop Brothers at Law was formed in 2015. In 2004 was when I had a partner for a few years from 98 to 2004. We were the law offices of Wasserman and Mejia, and he died of pneumonia. And then that's when I moved my office into the suite where my brother was. And we had, he lost his Craig Wasserman, lost Mark Wasserman. He did, uh, but all business consulting and, and corporate counseling and workers' compensation. And I was doing criminal defense and family law, but we were sharing office space and we were doing our separate things. Every once in a while, we'd work on things together. Then we fast forward past 2008, 2009, 
my brother's son, who's known now as J Cures for the company called West Coast Cure, which is a very big cannabis company out here uh, in California and throughout the States. And he showed a penchant for a green thumb and a taste for cannabis at an early age because my brother at the time was going through a nasty divorce, 10-year marriage, four kids. My nephew I'm referring to was the oldest. And at 13 years before that, he was having a lot of emotional problems as kids going through divorces do. And the doctors he was seeing wanted to shove opiates and Ritalin and all sorts of shit in his mouth. And my brother wasn't having any of that. Went in the backyard one day and said, look, they want to give you these pills. I don't want you to take pills. You want to chill out? Smoke this. You know, and if you're going to smoke this, we'll do it in the backyard here. Don't do it with your friends at school. And, you know, you, you, you do it here. Yeah. With and we didn't know it was going to lead to, you know, years later, 10 years down the road. Now he's growing very good, servicing cancer patients and AIDS patients and, you know, really doing it for these patients. And at that time here in California, you had to operate as a not-for-profit cooperative or a collective. And there were certain ways that you had to do things with your documentation and paperwork and payroll and taxes and all that so that when you got busted with the felonies, because it's a crime first, felony first, and then if you were able to prove you were doing it right, get the case dismissed. So over like a 10-year period, my, my nephew caught seven different felonies, a bunch of different cases, and we got them all dismissed because – and it wasn't because he was operating properly. That was like our – you know, you have your, your lines of defenses. Well, if we have to use that one, we'll get to it. We never did because we, we, we won at the cops are liars. They did an illegal search. And when they say, oh, he consented to a search, I mean, you know what our motto is. Imagine my nephew who's been told all his life, like he really, he's going to consent. I don't. And so, you know, we, we end up beating those cases because we prove through video and everything else and how the cops make up their lies. And when people shut the fuck up, we don't have to deal with anybody else's voice or language, just a cop weaving it himself. And then we can get them. And then we get the case dismissed. We're able to get all the product back. Because he was operating properly. So that, as I said, that was like back in like 2008, 2009, and all these cases we did for him over the years. And then we get to, and then I don't even know, whenever Instagram came out, might have been 2012 or 13 or whatever it was, my nephew, was, you guys got to get on Instagram. You need to get on Instagram. There's people in cannabis are in there and you can help them. And I looked at it and I'm like, yeah, there's like pot, pictures of pot and tits and I didn't. Mean, I'm on Facebook. I did, you know, I, this is a, anyway. and we were like, get out of here. And so then we fast forward to January 22nd, 2015. That day will live in my head forever because my nephew now who jet sets all over the place with Snoop and Wiz Khalifa and all he's, and he's been with those guys since they were before they were who they were getting them their meds and their can when they came to California and stuff like that. And so he'll pop into our office every whenever. He popped in this one day. Hey, I've got some friends who want to interview you guys and have you smoke and talk about. And this was in 2015 when in 2016, adult use was about to happen in California. So they wanted attorneys to come on this talk show to talk about the laws and smoke with them. They couldn't find any attorneys who would come on and smoke. So my nephew tells them, my uncle and my dad will do it. <laughs> but my brother didn't he was not happy about that and it's like why'd you tell him that i'm not gonna go smoking and blah 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 and i was like where do we go i'm ready let's go <laughs> yeah of course where, where's the camera let's go and so me and my brother had a, had a had a discussion about legalities and the fact that we have our medical cards here in california we're going to a private facility where they allow it we're not breaking any laws we're we're good let's do it okay when do we go Right now, we have to go right now. We have to go up to Hollywood, their studios, and we have to go right now, my nephew. So, all right, we did it. And so what we found out was it was uh, Be Real from Cypress Hill and his Be Real TV internet show uh, site that he has and a show called Getting High with Adam. 
And it was a, a, an influencer who's named Adam Ill. And out here in California and in the States, he's a big, uh, he's one of the best known hosts of like cannabis events and things of that nature. And he's doing all sorts of other things. But he, he brought us on, we went down there and brought us on this podcast. And he was just a stoner consumer who's like, I'm driving around in the car. What should I do with my stuff? I don't know. Teach. Uh, and we, you know, and we were doing everything that, that we are doing now, except there really wasn't a script. The script as it's known now, it was just, uh, you, you shut the fuck up, you know? And, and, and so as we were taking questions and it ended up, they usually go an hour. We had like three hours and calls were coming in and we're smoking. And again, my nephew goes, you got to create an Instagram. And so my brother took it upon himself, knowing nothing, nothing about social media, to go create our Instagram account. And so our Instagram account, Pot Brothers at Law, our main Instagram account is pot underscore brothers underscore at underscore law, which because of my brother, I have to say that way now and forever, because when you create, and here's a tip, if you don't know, when you create your Instagram account, like my brother did, he put P-O-T space Brothers space. When you hit that space bar, it creates the underscore. So that became very annoying for me as I do these things and I have to, I have to do that. But he created it. And at that point, it was, okay, what are we going to do with Instagram? You know, I have 5,000 friends on Facebook, which is the most they allow. And I had always used that. And I was I, right on top of that with my law practice and free, it's free advertising on these social media things. And so, I needed to learn how to use Instagram. And, you know, again, it was a platform. Hey, maybe we'll get a few new clients. We could teach some people things. And back then, it was only 15 second videos. So we ended up creating what I called, we called the 15 second tip of the day, which I ripped off from Tony Horton of Beachbody fame, P90X. I did all mm-hmm. the workout programs and he went, I have your work, your tip of the day for the. So 15 second tip of the day. And we started with a series of 15 second tips on what to do when you get pulled over. And we were concentrating on cannabis users in California because we're California attorneys and cannabis users get screwed with the most because of the smell and all that. So that was our initial focus. And as we were teaching, just basically, you know, you shut the fuck up and say as little as possible. We were getting questions and and people were gravitating to we had like 5000 followers the first week on Instagram so it's like wow something's going on here i sat i studied instagram for a good 2 weeks and other things and just algorithm shit and i you know just trying to figure out how and what's the best way for us to do this and you know it ultimately led to you know four posts a day and posting every 3 4 you know it was all very specific the way i was doing it in the beginning as we were growing. And then as we were getting questions, well, what do I do if the cop says this? Well, what do I do if the cop, what happens this and there? And so that's where we were like, we got to come up with something that's really just simple, easy. And it was like 55 words we had first, you know, then well, we can cut it down. And, you know, as attorneys, brief, right? Brief it, be brief as little as possible. And so we got it down to 25 words, ultimately, over a period of time, as we were growing with it. And what's cool is we have our business cards that, you know, the first one, you know, has, you know, it's, they're different. They went through stages until we got what we felt. Okay, this is it. These are the 25 words and you shut the fuck up. And the explosion through social media, while we built ourselves up from 2015 to December 25th, 2018, we had 120,000 followers. Which in three years, very good by all accounts, as I was seeing, watching other accounts and stuff like that. And people were like, wow, you guys are growing fast, growing fast. And so because I had us on every single social media platform and I wasn't pushing it, I just had a presence, right? We created the accounts because I figured we, we should just be everywhere. And I had different notification sounds set. So I don't miss anything because for attorneys, one call. It's all it takes. And somebody's in jail that night or they had a big accident, whatever it is. So and we, I don't want to miss any of it. So I have the different notification set. And I had a Facebook page for us that had about 300 followers on it. And every two weeks or so, it would go ding. 
with a little mess notification that somebody was had a question or whatever. And so I'm on vacation. It's December 25th, 2018. And my phone goes ding, 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 ding. And, and it's just not stop. I never, I was like, my phone's broken. What's going on? Mm-hmm. And Facebook things were coming and I, I turned it off. I turned it on. It was still going. I get to my laptop and I'm just, I'm trying to find, it's being shared. It's being like, I'm trying to fill kit the hell. And I finally find the page called Respect My Region which at the time was like a small hip hop political page. Uh, guys ran it out of Seattle, Washington. And they reposted one of our videos, our shut the, one of our Shut the Fuck Up Friday videos that we started doing. And we talked about an illegal cannabis store that got raided. Three people worked there. Two of them told the cops, I volunteer here. One of them follows us, shut the fuck up. We got that case dismissed. And that was reposted by Roger Stone. Now, do you know who Roger Stone is? Enlighten me. Roger Stone is a huge political strategist here in the States who helped get Nixon elected and Reagan and the Bushes and Trump and was sentenced to eight years for a bunch of shit. And then Trump commuted his sentence. And he said, these guys should be my attorneys and reposted it. Now, what's funny about that is he never shuts the fuck up, Roger Stone. <laughs> and HBO did a, uh, did a great documentary on him. So if you Google Roger Stone and HBO, there's a, there's a great documentary on this guy. Uh, but him reposting it then just, it got reposted and seen by everybody. From Snoop to P Diddy to Rappaport and the and Barstool Sports, I never even heard of it, and all these other huge outlets that I'd never heard of before were just over, 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 and and so now like, to date, that particular video has like five, six hundred million views alone, and it still gets wow. passed around, and that led to. Production companies calling us, Comedy Central and Tosh and MTV and interviews. And, you know, we're now in the process of shooting a docuseries. And it all started with that viral video really going nuts and uh, teaching people a learning. And as I remember, as I said, we started this whole shut the fuck up, concentrating on California cannabis patients. And as soon as it, as it really started going, we were like, you know, your right to shut the fuck up is all over the United States and for the Fifth Amendment, not just California. And then as we've learned through gentlemen like yourself and other barristers, attorneys, counselors and all over the world, that shutting the fuck up when you're dealing with law enforcement is not a bad thing to do. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's been quite incredible. And the fact that we've trademarked the script in those words and Shut the fuck up. It's been uh, quite a journey. So come on, on the Legally Speaking podcast, let's hear the script for anyone tuning in from the US. Let, let's have it. All right. Now, are, are you, do you know it yet? I am not fully versed. I will be in about a week's time after all. We'll talk about Clubhouse in a minute. So I yeah. don't want to get it wrong on the record. <laughs> yeah. so you go for it. And then you're I gonna, promise you a week's time. I'm bringing you in on our Shut the Fuck Up Friday script challenge on Instagram to introduce yeah. you to everybody and you'll have to do it. So you, so this is what me and my brother usually, I'll do my brother's part, but we usually do this together. Um, and I actually, I do this Every day, I call it the daily script review. And if you go to look at my Instagram and Snapchat stories and Facebook stories, it's there. I do this at least once a day, sometimes more. And I urge everybody to do it. It's called the daily script review. And it's this. Why did you pull me over? I'm not discussing my day. Am I being detained or am I free to go? I invoke the fifth and you shut the fuck up. Now, that's the daily script review. Now, when we do it with my brother, it goes, I'm the cop. Or when we do the, the, the script challenge, it's just like this. I got somebody like yourself in our Instagram live. I'm here and I'm the cop. I say, okay, I'm the cop. I pull you over. I say, what's that smell in your car? You know, where are you going so fast? Why are you sweating? What are you nervous about? I and mean, there's thousands of things to cop. And no matter what the cop says, you say, why did you pull me over? And the reason is because in the United States, 
at a traffic stop, a cop has roughly eight to nine minutes to write you a traffic ticket and send you on your way unless they find other independent probable cause to further detain you and do other things, which usually comes about because you talk. So why, and, and I say that because just because a cop pulls you over doesn't mean it's a traffic stop. You know, what if your tire's flat? What if, who knows? And cops will come up, the, the, the real savage, hey, how you doing today? Nice hat you're wearing. And they'll just start bullshitting with you as they're looking in every crack and crevice of your car to try to determine how they can get into it. So you want to cut them right off. Why did you pull me over? And they tell you, you know, you were speeding. And then comes the questions, what's that smell? How many drinks have you had? And again, doesn't matter. Whatever they say, the, easy re- the, the only response is, I'm not discussing my day officer. You're very polite, very calm. And the fact of the matter is, you don't have to. It's none of their business where you're going or what you're doing. I don't tell my mom. Why do I got to tell a strange cop? You don't. I'm not discussing my day. Then that's where you're going to find out which cop you got. You get the one who respects your rights and what you're doing, and they don't see criminal activity jumping out at them. You get that ticket, you get that warning, they send you on your way. And we get messages like that every day. Successful script stories, hashtag successful script stories, and we post those all the time. But if you get that cop who hates that you know your rights and you're making his job harder and you think you know more than him and he's got his complex, and he's going to say, what the fuck's your problem? You can't answer my questions. You can't just cooperate with me. You can't tell me. I'm just trying to keep people safe. And no matter what he asked you then, am I being detained or am I free to go? Office. Because then now he's got that decision to make. Am I going to really detain this person? I don't see anything going on. They know they're right. They're not going to talk. That's when we hope you get let go. Or again, the cop, no, you're detained, you know, get out of the car. They ask you to get out of the car, you get out of the car, put your hands behind your back. And I will say this about cooperating. When cops try to use that tactic to trick you, you're not cooperating. You are cooperating. You saw the lights, you pulled over, cooperate. You turned your engine off, cooperate. You handed your license, insurance, and registration, you cooperate. Answering questions does not equate to cooperating with cops. It equates to telling on yourself and talking when you don't have to. But that's their fate. You're not cooperating with me. You don't have to talk. And so once they say you're detained, then you have to say, I invoke the fifth. Because again, here in the States, I invoke the fifth under case law. Our great Supreme Court has opined that you must speak in order to invoke your right to be silent by explicitly stating, I invoke the fifth. And then no matter what the cops say, do, scare, threaten you, all of it, you shut the fuck up. And that's it. And that's the script. And so the daily script review, I just created the daily script review challenge where I'm challenging people to do it faster than me. Why did you pull me over? I'm not discussing my name. I'm being detained over to go. I invoke 15. Shut the fuck up. I'm going to take you on that challenge. So when I come onto your Instagram, I'm going to try and take you on for that challenge. But um, thank you so much for sharing that, Mark. And you have had huge social media success and you're a massive advocate for that. I think you've got over a million followers worldwide. You've done everything. You're everywhere. So everyone should definitely follow you. I do want to ask, what's your position on legalizing other drugs? I think all drugs should be legal. I think that people should be able to put whatever they want in their bodies. And if they want to kill themselves over it, don't kill other people, you know, but, and then that's where the problem is when, with, with addicted drug users and stuff like that. But I do believe as Hunter Thompson did that if you legalize all drugs, I don't think we'd have the problems that we have. People want to do what they can't do. You know, I, and so, but I, but that's my, I, I think all drugs, I think it all should be legal. Okay. And then you've been really vocal on Clubhouse recently, and you've been educating a lot of people on why they should stop calling cannabis such as weed, marijuana, 
Did you want to tell our listeners more about that and why it's important? I know you touched on adult use earlier as well. So just yes. tell us a bit more about it all. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, you go back to the 1930s, a guy named uh, Harry Anslinger and, and the way they demonized cannabis. When you look at the dictionary definition, it's sativa L, cannabis, cannabis. And so they 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 used the term it, 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 oh in the nineteen thirty ter- marijuana thirty two I think it was marijuana tax act marijuana and they spelled it with an H to put it over with the minorities and demonize it and give them a means and a way to arrest these people and that's when all the all of it started and the negative stigma calling it that and marijuana and weed and all that that's just what it is now and so it's so much part of the vernacular that and recreational that's the worst that's the dirtiest word for cannabis as far as i'm concerned because it's not a recreational drug it's just not it's a plant that's a medicine that was before it was demonized, you go back centuries, being used for to build houses and cars and all sorts of things hemp can be used for when you talk about cannabis and its derivatives. And when we are advocating for this change and for laws to change, the people who make these laws, the idiots who are archaic and aren't doing what the will of the people, because in the in, in United States, the va- I think it's like upwards of 70% now that want it at least medicinally. And that's, that's a whole other issue, but their, their, their representatives are, aren't doing it. They're not doing what the people say. They're not bowing to the will of the people. And when we talk to these legislatures and the people who are supposed to do this, when they hear words and I, I yell at uh, congressmen and doctors and scientists who talk to, who have the, communication with these people. And I hear them say, yeah, well, with the marijuana, I go, no, 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 no. When you say marijuana, when you say recreational to these people, it furthers that negative stigma, especially recreational, because where do you go in the world to a bar and say, can I have my recreational beer, please? I I don't know of a place. And it's adult. You're an adult. You can use it, period. And so, for instance, in California, we have now what is called the Adult Use Medical Cannabis Regulation Safety Act. When they came out with it, it was the Recreational Medical Marijuana Act. Activists and advocates like myself and others were up in arms. You're not calling it marijuana. You're not calling it recreational. Recreational is where the kids go to play at the rec center. Kids do this recreational. I mean, that's, that's, that's the horrible part about it. And when we talk to those people who are making decisions and we further that vernacular, we're not going to get anywhere and we're not going to change their minds because they're recreational. And I, I don't know how we go backwards, but it never even should have been a divide. It should have never been called medical cannabis because now you're differentiating and anybody using cannabis I don't care if it's an 18 year old kid go, I'm getting high with my friend. You are medicating and you don't even know it and you're self medicating, period. And the THC and the CBD is helping your body in so many different ways. You know, it shouldn't be that distinction, but it is. And we've got to steer clear of those words and just using word cannabis and adult use, especially when we're talking to somebody who still believes in reefer madness and the devil's lettuce. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mark. And you're doing a great job to use your voice, particularly through all of your social media platforms. And I just want to quickly, before we wrap up, talk a little bit more about your radio talk show, because that's just gone through the through the roof with success, Cannabis yes. Talk 101. So can you tell us a bit more about that and why do you decided to branch into a radio show? Yeah, that's uh, so, wow. I think towards the end of 2015 or 2016, uh, Blue, Christopher Wright, who had created Cannabis Talk 101, came to us for a legal problem that we helped him with. And the first meeting in our office, he was like, you guys want to be on a talk show? 
because I created a radio show. It's on a small FM radio station and it's called Cannabis Talk 101. I had another attorney, but it didn't work out. And me and my brother looked at each other and we're like, oh, I know. What do we have to do? We'd show up and talk. No, I can do that. And so mm -hmm. we did that. And Cannabis Talk 101 just it took off. So we went from 2016, 2019, we signed a partnership deal with iHeartMedia to become the only cannabis podcast to be partnered with iHeartMedia or any big media conglomerate. All these podcast shows and, and things that are on different platforms, you, you can put a podcast anywhere, right? You can create it in your basement yeah. and put it anywhere. And that's great. We love all those, but we, we are distinguished because iHeart is pushing us. And you go to, you know, all their AM and FM radio stations around the, around the country and our commercials are playing and we're being pushed and we're now heard in 126 countries, which right now we're very proud of considering we signed that deal towards the end of 2019 with our big launch date, 420, 2020 at 420 PM at the iHeart Studio Amphitheater with, I mean, it doesn't even matter who was going to be there. <laughs> and we, we, we ended up launching, uh, we, there's four of us, me and my brother, Blue and Big Joe Grande are, are, are we're all co-hosts and we were all at home on Zoom. And that's how we launched. And, you know, in the midst of, I think it was uh, iHeart lost 80% of their ad revenue, right? During, during the pandemic as, no, everything folded, but we powered through and we seemingly have come out on the other side. Our downloads are, you know, up, up, up. And we're in all these different countries. We're interviewing uh, a lot. You know, we recently interviewed Tommy Chong and Santana and a bunch of sports stars and athletes and doctors and, and really trying to normalize all of this and, and really get it out. That's why we touted as the CNN, Fox News, The View, except it's four guys. Although we do have our new segment, the women of cannabis, we have two, two great gals, Janae and Christine, and they have a segment where they talk about all the women that are doing major things in cannabis and in the industry. So that yeah, cannabis talk 101 on iHeartRadio, Apple podcast, wherever you get your podcast, you can catch it. We drop new shows every day, Monday through Friday. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. We have, when we don't have guests, we have four distinct segments. My brother does cannabis news and is always talking about a new congressperson or senator or somebody who supports cannabis. And we need more of that, right? And then uh, our creator and co-host Blue does who's making waves in the industry, all about who's up there, what influencers or who's really doing big things. Joe Grande does Go Green, which is all about the stocks and the business and the, and the all the different mergers going on. And just as you know, there's just every day there's something happening in the business world with cannabis as well. And then, of course, the best segment is <laughs> <laughs> and I get when cannabis goes bad. And those are stories that I rip from the headlines around the world or from consultation calls or cases that I handle where cannabis is involved and something horrible happens. But what I like to point out when I read these headlines, you all, you know, and, and, and every time I do an article or I do a story, I cross out marijuana and I put the word cannabis and I use the word cannabis and all of these headlines, even, oh, big drug bust, 15 pounds of marijuana, right? But then you read the story and there was a hundred pounds of cocaine and three Uzis and all this other shit. But the headline is about yeah. cannabis, which is another way they are demonizing it and keeping it at the forefront of reefer madness. So I like to do those articles and you know, really point out that hip hop. Like, why is that the headline when all this other shit is there? And then when we have guests, we do what's called our cannabis talk high five questions. I just want to ask one final question because I'm sure our listeners will want to know, and I, I can't remember for everything we've discussed whether we've gone through it. So what is the current position on cannabis use in California? Can you provide us with a little overview of the actual law? Absolutely. If you are, if you are under 21, you cannot possess 
use or cons- you cannot possess or use it if you're under 21 unless you have a physician's recommendation from a doctor so if you have a physician's recommendation if you're 18 to 21 you can get one from a doctor by yourself if you're if you're under 18 you need your parents consent and signature along with the doctor now if you don't if you have a physician's recommendation you are allowed to smoke wherever anybody else is smoking their cigars, cigarettes, or anything else, unless you are a thousand feet from a school or youth facility, you're in a no smoking zone, you're in a motor vehicle that's operating while operating a boat or on a school bus. So if you have that physician's recommendation in California, These are the only five places you can't smoke. Now, if you're 21 and older, you are only allowed to purchase and possess up to one ounce, and you cannot smoke it anywhere in public. You have to be at someone's private facility or private house, or there are a few states that are starting to finally have lounges where people can go. You know, we need more of those, but it's really horrible. you, you really, as an adult, without that physician's recommendation, you cannot smoke it anywhere. You got to be very careful about that. And with the physician's recommendation, you can purchase and carry up to eight ounces versus one ounce. And, and I leave everybody with this too. So it ain't legal. There's limits on the legalities. And if you fly with it, it's a felony. And while the vast majority of people get away with it, There are plenty of people who don't, and we represent them, and there's you're cutting deals and trying to keep them out of jail. So know your rights, know the laws whenever you're flying or or using wherever you're at, because they differ from state to state and country to country. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mark. It's been an amazing pleasure having you on the show. So I just want to finally ask, if people want to get in touch about anything they've discussed today, What's the best platform for them to do that? And please also make a shout out for your referral scheme because I think that's great. So yeah, shout out any relevant web links and tell us more about your referral links and social media handles. Thank you. So our big our big page is our Instagram. It's pot underscore brothers underscore at underscore law. And then uh, we are on all social media platforms, including TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat all of them. So you can follow us on all those and see all of our educational content that we plaster everywhere. Our main website, popbrothersatlaw.com. And you can find all of our other legal information there. We do sell uh, merch, hashtag STFU stuff, hats, shirts, stickers. That's at pballmerch.com, pballmerch.com. And we also jumped into finally After years of trying products and telling companies no, we found the place that works for both me and my brother, popbrothersatlawcbd.com. So if you have pain, arthritis, and you're old fucks like us, the rubs and the gummies and pets product for your pets for CBD, we finally hook up with a good place. So that's something else we're doing, popbrothersatlawcbd.com and clubhouse clubhouse is it's three weeks like three or four weeks in now myself and we've created well we already had the worldwide attorney referral network through all of our other social media platforms but now on clubhouse you can join the attorney referral network couldn't fit the whole thing in there they give you a little bit of space in that in that headline mm-hmm. so the the attorney referral network And what that is, we get calls because of our social media messages, direct messages, all over our different social media platforms from people around the world with legal problems, not just cannabis, not just criminal defense, just we've become some law firm that people uh, know and trust. And we get calls for, hey, do you know somebody who does family law? Do you know how somebody is this? You know somebody in Timbuktu? Do you know somebody in Russia? Do you know somebody in Moldova? I mean, everywhere, UK. And so we created the system so we can refer people to good, honest attorneys wherever they are throughout the world. So if you're an attorney and you're, and you're watching this, link up with us. We do a quick Zoom meet. 
and, you know, vet people out to make sure that, you know, we're on the same page. Haven't met an attorney yet through Clubhouse that uh, I haven't liked or put on put on the referral list. Uh, so that's something that we're, we're really proud of now and just trying to connect attorneys with people who need help. And we've been doing it almost every day um, through with the help of Clubhouse. And if anybody out there wants to just say hi and talk to us, 855 was Law. Or if you have a legal problem and you want to connect to us that way, hmm. you can get us. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a real pleasure having you on the Legally Speaking podcast. I've really enjoyed learning about your journey, your mission, what you're trying to do. I wish you lots of continued success. But from all of us on the show for now, over and out. All right. Thank you. This week's review comes from JTC underscore FF. JTC underscore FF says, Engaging and relevant, Rob is fantastic at drawing out a wide variety of people from the profession and allowing listeners to get a better understanding of the legal industry and its many facets. This is innovative and informative. I absolutely love a bit of flattery. So thank you so, so much for your kind words, JTC underscore FF. It really means a lot. Make sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts if you want the chance to be given a shout out next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Legally Speaking Podcast. If you enjoyed the show and want to help support us, remember to leave us a rating and review on Apple iTunes. You can also support the show and gain exclusive benefits, bonus content and much more by signing up to our Patreon page, which is www.patreon.com forward slash Legally Speaking Podcast. Thanks for listening.